Welcome to Film 360, the Full Circle Film Show. Tonight, I've got a good friend, Adam Argyle. He's here. We're going to talk about Phoenix Incorporated, which just landed on Amazon Prime, and we're pretty excited about. So sit tight for Film 360. Thank our sponsors, Voyage Direct Primary Care and Creative Stream, and we're going to be showing you a little bit more about them later. But let's uh, let's welcome our guest, Adam Argyle. We've been friends for a lot of years. Yeah, right? several uh, years. Worked on a lot of projects together. Mm -hmm. So he's an actor, and he's a fight choreographer, and I think I'm forgetting a couple other great items on the on the resume, but. Why don't you just give a little intro to yourself? So, yeah, as you said, uh, we worked on a lot of great projects together. I uh, kind of uh, more of a stage actor, but love dabbling in film and, and playing around. I, I got my start at a very young age, swinging swords and fencing with my father. So kind of segued into Shakespeare and, and moved on from there, a theater major in college and haven't looked back since. Now, when it comes to fight choreography, uh, this is something I've thought about. Which do you find, where do you find you use it more, for the stage or for the screen? You know, that's a tough question. Um, I find that I, I use it almost everywhere. Mm. Um, one of the things that I find is, is interesting, I may not be dealing with actors who have gone into theater going, I'm going to get into a fight on stage, but have you ever had to slap somebody, mm. right? You ever seen the Three Stooges, Keystone Cops? That's all stage combat. Pratt falls, faint. You may never have to pick up a sword in your entire theatrical career, but I guarantee you're going to have to fall at some point, and and that. And so, you use it even in shows that don't even have stage directions of they fight. What has been your favorite fight to to choreograph? You know, I think it was uh, a stage production of Three Musketeers I did at the Covey uh, about eight years ago. Um, one of the fight sequences uh, ended up being about five minutes long and involved about 13 people. Uh, you had uh, the Three Musketeers plus D'Artagnan um, fighting each two to three guards uh, and then you add in a couple of other bystanders and that was really fun kind of working collaboratively with each of the uh, uh, the actors. I was the co-choreographer, um, and we kind of let each of the actors develop kind of their own phrases, and then I was asked to weave all of the different phrases together mm. through the set piece, and it ended up being an extremely tiring but very epic <laughs> sword fight. <laughs> awesome. Now, I, and I didn't even intend to talk a lot about fight choreography, but I, I think it is important and overlooked in a lot of smaller budget productions especially. Um, but what is what are some of the main safety problems that you've seen on sets, especially film sets? So a lot of the safety problems I, I run into on, on film sets are either uh, not thinking through timeline. Um, hmm. uh, it takes a lot of rehearsal to get those fights to the point where they look good but are safe. Um, with film, you can kind of... We kind of have a little bit of leeway because uh, all I need to be able to do it is is do it perfectly once or twice as long as we can get the angles and, and shots the director wants. But once we've got those shots, we're done with that choreography. So we can work really hard and fast and get it up to speed on camera and then, all right, let's move on to the next chunk. Uh, whereas on stage, you've got to be able to do it start to finish flawlessly for six weeks every night. Um, that so not planning through how much time it, it will take. 
Uh, sometimes it's it's uh, the props. They're like, well, we're going to grab these swords, but these swords weren't made for full on mm. um, uh, not combat ready. yet. Well, not even just battle ready. Even the battle ready ones sometimes will be really? uh, not quite up to snuff. The the stage combat ones, they're they're designed. Um, balanced like a battle ready one but they're designed to be able to withstand the the repeated hits that even a battle ready sh sword wouldn't have had to withstand interesting so okay and i actually got to experience your uh fight choreography as well as your safety side up close and personal because i learned a lot of lessons <laughs> when we worked together um since you kind of became our our safety <laughs> and fight choreographer anyway um what about guns? Let's talk about guns for a minute because I think almost every indie filmmaker out there has guns in their first production. Of course. And has no idea how to be safe because I didn't. So with guns, um, you, you follow basically the same principles that you learn in any gun safety course. Um, mm. These things are tools. You don't, you, you don't point it at something you don't intend to shoot. You don't right? You treat it as if it's loaded regardless of whether it's loaded or not. But on, on, uh, on a set, we have some protocols that we follow of um, usually you'll have designated crew members that that is their job is to handle the firearms. Mm. Um, as soon, they're the ones that walk in, hand them off to the actors at the last second before they're actually needed. Mm. Um, and uh, there's some call and response stuff that we do to let them know so that way the actor knows, hey, this gun is loaded, it's ready to go. When the actor hands it back off to the to the wrangler, right, we know the status of the gun. Um, and then, of course, with camera, it's really nice because we can do a lot of tricks with angles and stuff. So yeah. it looks like I'm aiming at somebody, and I'm like three feet away and completely offline. <laughs> uh, what's your recommendation on real firearms on set versus prop firearms? Where possible, especially with a lower budget, um, if you can get non-firing replicas, they're they're much better um, because obviously you have no danger of somebody getting hurt. The flip side is if you're actually going to be firing something, then you'd have to work out some sort of believable if visual effect in post. But um, the a uh, lot of times they might be easier to come by. Yeah. Uh, and that, but even on even on a big budget set, even we have fully functioning firing firearms they are not designed as real firearms. They are designed as props, uh, firing blanks. They can't be firing real. A lot of times they're not even chambered for a real round. Yeah. Um, more like caps or things. Yeah. So you get the, the muzzle flash and the bang, but, yeah. but that. Um, but sometimes they're, they're harder to come by or more expensive, but, and sometimes they're not the best quality either in terms of workmanship. They, they'll jam really easy. and. Mm -hmm and then you've got to deal with that. So it's go with what you want to see and yeah. then make sure if you've got live round stuff that you're following the proper protocol. And let's talk about the call and response stuff because that was a big part of mm -hmm. what was new to me. So uh, when somebody would, when you'd hand me a gun before you did, I can't, I can't remember the terminology now off the top of my head. Okay, so it... it, it, it the terminology will, will be different. So if I'm handing you a gun and it's actually supposed to be fired in the shot, then if I'm the Wrangler, I'm gonna make sure that the gun is all ready to go, right? It's cocked, lock, ready to rock, whatever, right? So I'd hand it off to you in a safe position, barrel down, right? And he says, all right, here you are, weapon is hot, meaning it's ready to go. That's right. And then you would, uh, when you take the gun, you would, uh, you would say no. thank you, it acknowledge you, uh, thank you, weapon is hot, okay? Um, and then when we've got the take, we're going to do that and we need to reset, whether we need to reset the take or if we're good on the take, whatever, uh, you'd hand it back to me and you'd say, all right, say we actually didn't get to the point where you had to fire it in the shot. So you'd hand it back to me, no shots fired, weapon is hot, right? And I'd say, thank you, no shots fired, weapon is hot. That way we know exactly the status of the gun, what I need to do with it. If you fired the shot, you'd, you'd let me know how many, right? Fired one shot weapon is hot or if in the shot right you you fired it it was a single action right 
gun so it has to be cocked, you can say weapon is cold, right? So it's a way for us to be able to know what the status of the gun is and everybody interacting with that weapon knows the status of the weapon at that time. And you've got some, you've got some certifications, correct? Yes. Um, I ha I've been through a, a lot of training. Um, even though we'll use the term certifications, they really aren't a certificate saying, hey, I'm certified to do this. What it is is they're, they're more accurately called skills proficiencies mm -hmm. uh, and, and that. Um, I have uh, taken some uh, firearms training through the Society of American Fight Directors. Um, I have some skills proficiency in a few different weapon styles um, and that. And really what their certifications are, it really just says, hey, Adam has gone through our prescribed training for these particular disciplines. So when he says he knows what we're do he's doing, we'll back him up. <laughs> fair, fair. Awesome. Okay, uh, Adam is part of a group. They're called the Masters of Dueling. And what, what, uh, real quick, we're going to take a break for some sponsors in a sec, but talk about what the Masters of Dueling is. So the Masters of Dueling is, is myself and two colleagues of mine, Jacob Tice and Matthew Carlin. Um, all of us have, have really uh, found our niche in theater with stage combat. And uh, we were asked, Jacob and I were asked um, several years ago to provide a sword fight demonstration at one of the first years of the Utah Valley Renaissance Fair. Um, and we came up with this idea of a stage combat comedy show, and we, we ended up pulling in our friend Matthew, and uh, we're, we're really getting some steam. You've got three different personas, and think about Three Stooges with swords, and yeah, it's, it's quite fun. We'll, um, potentially we'll be at Fenex in awesome. this coming month. We will definitely be at the Utah Valley Renaissance Fair in August. Uh, we'll be up at the Renaissance Fair up in Ogden in May uh, and potentially up at Wizarding Days in Logan in July. So Great, great. And you can check out, they have a Facebook page, Masters of Dueling. You should check it out. They actually post some really fun stuff uh, in addition to information about events they'll be at. So we're, we're going to take a quick break for sponsors. When we'll be back, we're going to talk about Adam's acting side of things. So just sit tight. Hello, I'm Dr. John Sanders. I'm a family physician and the reason that I went into medicine was because I love helping and caring for people. I created Voyage Direct Primary Care because the cost and complexities of insurance companies have driven people away from accessing the care that they need. I am a board certified family physician and families, physicians across the nation provide upwards of 90% of health care to Americans. As such, I'm uniquely positioned to provide uh, that care to my clients. Uh, cutting out the middlemen, cutting out the cost and complexities of insurance, and putting care back into the healthcare model. So how does it work? For one low monthly fee, Voyage Direct Primary Care provides you with fantastic holistic family medical care. Voyage Direct Primary Care offers unprecedented access to your family doc via same-day office visits, but also we provide access via text, phone call, video chat, there are no co-pays or deductibles for any of these services, it's just one low monthly fee. In order to optimize your wellness, I like to spend adequate time with you. I like to listen to your problems and get to know you and build that relationship. It's not uncommon for me to spend 30 to 60 minutes with my clients. This helps me be the best doctor for you that I can be. Voyage Direct Primary Care puts old school principles back into healthcare, where your physician really gets to know you, has a relationship with you, and isn't afraid to make house calls on occasion. Voyage Direct Primary Care offers a unique healthcare experience that can save you money whether you have insurance or not. To learn more or sign up, visit voyagedpc.com. Voyage Direct Primary Care, where caring is our superpower. Welcome back. 
Now we're going to start tackling your other, <laughs> the other <laughs> app. So initially, uh, I made the short film of Phoenix, and as I was thinking of people to cast, you were one of the first people to come to mind. Uh, having seen you act in some roles, I thought he, you, you have the, the appropriate persona. You could portray it well to be Elijah. Thank you. Um, so, but also as a bonus, I also thought, hey, he's a great fight choreographer too, because I'd been in some shows that you had, that you had done work for. So it kind of, kind of came as a bonus, but ended up being a huge part of what we did. Um, so that was really fun. But I want to talk to you about how you tackle how you tackled the role of Elijah because I intentionally, he wasn't meant to be easy, mm. uh, an easy part to play. So, and, and I, it's funny because I would edit for hours. And then when we talk, when we would do dubbing or something, I'd be like, this isn't the same person that was on set. Like it, it was funny cause it felt so natural when mm -hmm. you did it that I would forget that it wasn't really how you were outside of filming, <laughs> uh, which is great. So, I, I, I approached Elijah like I do most any character I'm cast in. Um, the first thing I do is 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 the text. I, I read the lines, the the dialogue, the script. That that gives me the first impression of who this guy is. Um, and and so with Elijah, I, he was very very cool customer, very collected, very methodical, very calculating. Um, I really kind of enjoyed that very first stinger teaser of the short film. Uh, and you're like, okay, he doesn't seem like he's the best guy there. He's, he's kind of being set up as the villain. It kind of gave me an idea of, of uh, the fact that he's, he's a very, he has some very hard edges to it. Uh, but then I kind of got into his reasoning and, and why he does what he does and really started kind of finding the layers to the character. I mean, any person, there's, there's going to have multiple layers. Um, the next thing I do is once I kind of have an idea of the character from the, from the dialogue, from what he says, I then kind of find um, a part of myself. And, and Anthony Hopkins mm -hmm. has talked about, about doing this, that he doesn't play a character. He plays himself. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of find myself doing the same thing. I find a, mm -hmm. an an aspect of my personality that I I share with the character and I sort of exaggerate that as the character so with, with him I, I enjoy kind of the 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 calculating side the the methodical plan things out I I'm never been one to to formally write things down but Elijah is, and, and, I, and I found it was fun to play that side. Mm. Excellent. What, what would you say, and, and this is getting into me a little bit, this is your chance to take some pot shots at me, <laughs> what, mm. what were some of the hardest things during production? It's a low-budget production, uh, largely volunteer, it was, and it was intense. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the biggest challenges? So I think with the, with the original short film, I think part of it was uh, getting the dialogue down um, and, and that um, and kind of almost guerrilla filmmaking and, and still kind of learning this. As, as we moved into the, the, the episodes that we filmed, uh, I had a better handle on the character and was, was able to, okay, tweak the dialogue a bit. Um, as I got more in, I was like, okay, well, I'm playing Elijah, and I know what you're trying to say, but that's not the way I would say it. So I would, <laughs> I'd tweak words or change up phrases here and there. But uh, I kind of appreciate that he gave me the liberty to do that. But yeah, um, that I think I think that was sometimes the the writing of it. I'm like, okay, that it doesn't quite feel natural. I understand what you're saying, and so I'd maybe try and, and tweak say this is this is how i would say it as elijah and i think it, it's coming across the same way yeah in fact i collaborative directing is what i'm all about i think i've never done my best work as a dictator and uh frankly all the ideas that you brought took it up you know to a to another level it, it tuned the dialogue because i mean i've written dialogue that <laughs> that rhymed when it wasn't supposed <laughs> to rhyme sometimes and and, uh, you know, occasionally my dialogue gets a little sloppy 
because I read it in my head just fine, but somebody else reads it and not so much. So That's I how I would say it. But <laughs> Yeah, I appreciated those things that you brought that not only were from yourself, but also from your, your weapons training, mm -hmm. from your the various types of training you had, which gave it a terminology that I didn't have. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to a director in that situation? What, what could I have done better and what could somebody else do better to make that process? I think the, as an actor, the, the biggest thing that helps me is when the director trusts me as mm -hmm. an actor and say that. And, and even though, yeah, sometimes things got stressful, I never felt that I was not trusted. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, it's, it's, I, I've been asked and hired to do a job. Let me do my job, right? And my job is to give you what you want to see. So uh, on the one hand, trust me to do my job, but on the other hand, let me know what you need. And, and so I have a clear understanding of what you want to see, and then let me, let me do my job and, and help you see that. One, one thing I was curious, since you, you are primarily a stage actor, the first several times I saw you and worked with you were on stage. He was Gandalf in a, a production of The Hobbit with puppets. It was, yes. It was great. Uh, yeah, that, that concept was really kind of cool. That's I love that concept. Um, what what have you found to be the biggest difficulty in being between film and stage? Do you ever find yourself like being in one zone and having to really push over? Um, I only once have I found that, and that was uh, I, I'm used to more theatrical uh, stylings when it comes to vocal patterns, and so I, I was on set for a, a show uh, a film once where uh, the first line I gave the they got through and they're like, all right, now, you, your mic's right here. You can talk normally. <laughs> um, but for me, I've never really found it too difficult. Um, I enjoy the challenges. They're almost enough of a different animal, mm -hmm. right? Where we're stage, stage, I have to be able to be seen from 50 feet away, right? And then the back of the house and, and that. Whereas uh, I can do a lot of things on film when I've got the camera right up in my face. Um, and, and, and do things with just subtle eye movements. And I, I, I find it kind of really fun doing, doing both, um, um, and that, um, also kind of with the, the, the writing on, on a, a stage versus oh, screen. Yeah. Um, I, I, sometimes I feel like I have a little bit more time to focus or have to focus a little bit more when I'm on screen so I've just got to got to get this one uh, I've got to get this one scene and I may be shooting a scene from the end of the the piece f before I've ever done anything for the first and so I've got to think through it a little bit and say okay where am I coming from where am I going I haven't actually shot that piece yet whereas on stage it's I start at the beginning and I go to the end yeah so I can build that arc well, and on Phoenix was probably the most chaotic skit filming I have ever not only been like not only seen but been a part of, because um, I it took me weeks to nail that down. It'd be like okay, this afternoon we're gonna do this scene from episode one and this scene from episode two, or like the police station. Uh, I don't you weren't even there for these parts, but we filmed uh, all the scenes from all the episodes from this angle, and then. We would do all the scenes from all the episodes from a different angle. Oh, wow. We did that because we only had two, <laughs> two police filing cabinets, and we had to move them around to make it look like we had more. <laughs> and so it reduced our setup time, but we had to be like, okay, which tie are they wearing now? Is he wearing a suit coat or not a suit coat? And, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, that was what I remember. I remember one day on set where I, I think I wore – six different outfits that day because we were bouncing between so many different scenes that was fun though i actually really enjoyed that um i'm i'm proud that it turned out but it could have gone off the rails fast if if you guys hadn't all been quick on your feet um because yeah i mean there were times where it was a a complete emotional shift a complete arc shift i mean mm -hmm. oh jeez. Yeah, I, there were a couple of times where I would have to go and say, okay, wait a minute, I need to go look at my script for a second. All right, where am I? Where am I coming from? Okay, all right, I've got it. <laughs> and there were a couple of times where I know some of the actors just said, I, I did not to me, I could just know that they were saying to each other, I, I don't know what we're doing, but 
this is this is the scene. So here we go. Like the trust that everybody had in me was kind of ridiculous in hindsight. I felt like I was communicating my everything very well, but uh, shoot. So we've never I've never really been able to decompress with any of the actors <laughs> and, and kind of get some feedback. But what were some of your favorite things about Phoenix? So I think one of my my favorite things about Phoenix was the story and mm. and the character of Elijah and kind of discovering his backstory and and kind of building that out, which I hope we'd be able to to reveal more uh, at too. some point because he's got some really fun things and I've got some really cool ideas on that. But just the idea behind it of of having uh, this this guy who has this skill set, this eye for detail, and, and using that to help people out of hard times and that. And I, I kind of always wanted to know, where did that come from? You know, it's, it's funny because it's, it's, uh, it stands out in the lineup of my stories. If you were to see all the different stories I've ever written, that one just doesn't feel like it fits. It, it actually came from kind of a personal place, uh, unlike a lot of my other stories as well. It, it hit at a time in my life, so I, I had this rough idea. It was kind mm -hmm. of a medieval fantasy story initially. Uh, the, you know, the phoenix was like an actual character and, and uh, could kind of change people from an old life into it was almost like a conversion process of mm -hmm. conversion right to a higher level of living or whatever i mean it was it was very very fantasy <laughs> and, getting shades of gargoyles <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah it was just it was it was nothing like what it is mm -hmm. but it evolved over years i was i was in a difficult place i was at a job i hated i was at a you know, kind of a, just a place where every day felt like I was slogging through the same junk over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was pretty recently married. And so I was in this place where I, I wanted to escape my life, but I was married and I didn't want to leave my wife. I, I, right. I couldn't think of leaving her. So I hit this spot just like Aiden does in this short film where I kind of wanted to be dead like I, I kind of wanted to die but I didn't want to be dead I wanted to be able to leave behind everything that I that I had and start fresh completely new and I felt like oh if I could do that you know things would mm -hmm. things would change for me and so I wrote the short story and and I really loved it but I kept thinking of all these other things like oh I should try and stick in this little subplot and this subplot and this and they were all other clients that mm -hmm. Elijah had and that it wasn't until we were in production that I realized, oh, that would make for really good TV. Yeah. Because especially because suicide is such a problem. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell a story that told people, no, stay. Even if it means leaving everything behind, stay. And that's in a lot of ways, Phoenix Inc. is really strong in my mind because it's like the antithesis of 13 Reasons Why. It's almost the exact opposite. It's, it tells people why life is hard, but mm -hmm. says, no, you need to stick around for it anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a story I, I don't tell a lot <laughs> because it is somewhat personal, yeah. but I think it's important for people to know um, yeah. where it comes from. So I, I appreciate that, yeah. that question. Well, I, really, I, really, I really like it. Uh, what, that's one of the things, another one of the things I've really enjoyed about it is the fact that it's very much similar to a lot of the popular procedurals on TV now, but the message behind it is, is um, something you don't see. It's like there is hope, right? There are people out there who are good. There are people out there who want to help you, right? And, yeah. and, and that night, I really, I really latched onto that. I really, really loved that about that, about the, this, the show overall and, and the character of Elijah in specific. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming in, joining today. This was a uh, kind of interview that it didn't go where I expected it to, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. It's been fun. I uh, look forward to working in with you some more. So, And the, uh, we were talking about during one of the breaks, Masters of Dueling, mm -hmm. in addition to simply performing, you guys 
what are some of the other yeah. things that you offer? So yeah, we, we of course provide entertainment uh, and that, um, but we're also actors, uh, trained choreographers in that. So we will do workshops, we'll do choreography for shows, film, whatever. Um, yeah, Masters of Dueling uh, on Facebook, reach out to us, we're, we're there. Uh, the Masters of Dueling, excuse me, the Masters of Dueling at gmail.com, email us. We'd love to, to help out where we can and uh, have some fun. Awesome. And Phoenix Inc. is available on Amazon Prime, so if you want to go check it out. It's kind of confusing. It's a short film followed by three episodes. <laughs> um, but it's short stuff. Go check it out. It's streaming now, as well as three additional episodes will be coming out in the near future. So uh, one last thank you to our, our sponsors, Creative Stream, for use of their space, and Voyage Direct Primary Care. They have an awesome healthcare product for those of you who are especially filmmakers and, and other types of independent contractors. It's a great way to get some affordable healthcare. So check them out at voyagedpc.com, and we'll see you next week on Film360.